Okay guys, so in this video we've started working on adding support to actually send an email from our email client. So let's just have a look at that. Now I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't implemented the... I, in, this, uh, in this application what we're going to do is basically we're going to just store the email in a database on our server. And what you would do in a more realistic scenario would be something along the lines of doing the same thing. You would store the email and then you would either, into, unless you are an email service provider or something like that, which you are most likely not, you would integrate to one of the email service providers and actually send the email as part of a network call to them, either as a batch job or some other operation. Kind of depends on your strategy. We might touch on that later in the series, but for now this is going to be good enough for our intents and purposes. So let's dive in. So I've moved my card over to ongoing. We can actually move that to testing now because it's well, basically done. So the thing that's changed now is that if I hit compose and then I, if I inf for yeah, input some email here and a little bit of a message, and something like that and I hit send we actually we've successfully sent the email which is great and if we input something just gibberish like that something like this and we try to send that on the other hand we get an email like a failed message from our server now this is not the I just want to touch on this generally guys if you have a user facing application you don't want to leak these sorts of details about what actually went wrong but I'm a little bit lazy here so just remember that that a user should be told that something like the thing that they wanted to do went wrong but you should at no point leak this level of a specific information because anybody who is a developer or a hacker or anything like that can very easily just grab this message and figure out what systems you are using and different exploits that may be associated with the technologies that you have picked but let's have a look at the actual code so there's quite a few things to walk through so let's just start uh, at the very top so in order for us to be able to store our emails we have to have a database of some sort and the way that I chose to do this is to first and foremost ask okay what type of information are we going to store now because the model that we have for so far is fairly simple I don't really need a relational database I don't need some specific type of database or anything like that I just need a basic storage system and for that purpose it's very simple to just use MongoDB so we've added a connection to Mongoose which is just an API library on top of MongoDB so that I have a nice interface to work with and then basically when the server starts all we do is that we can connect to the MongoDB instance which is going to run on port 27017 and I'm just specifying the database to be called fmail and this is just the environmental variable that we've added so that once we want to do the make this into a production build and actually have something that runs in a service or a in, the, in the cloud or something like that we can actually provide the this email or like this specific domain for where the database is found so this is just so that we can override this default right so let's have a look at this docker compose file so i use docker for most of my needs when it comes to databases you don't have to use docker for this sort of thing but to me it makes a lot of sense because usually it's it's easier if you have docker running on your system because I, I I just prefer it, guys. You don't have to. It's just the way that I like to have it. So if I do Docker PS here, you will see that I'm actually running a Docker image using with MongoDB installed on it, and I've connected my ports accordingly so that we can actually connect to that database. And if you wanted to install your database directly on your machine, that's fine as well. But I like to use Docker. Right. And apart from that, we've also added a few testing scripts so that we can run tests or we can run like tests in watch mode. And I like to use Jest for this sort of thing. It's a very nice testing library. It is by far my favorite. Let's look at the application itself. So the th main thing that's changed here, we still have this hard-coded like getting emails and stuff of that nature, but this is the thing that has changed, which is the posting of email uh, to the emails endpoint. So the first thing that's going to happen now is that we are going to use this validate incoming email middleware that I added. Let's look at that. 
So the validate email or validate incoming email is this is just a practice that you should always have with you. You should at no point allow a client to post unverified information to your system at no point at all. You have to always be very upfront with what you expect as the server because the client could be compromised. In other words, you have no guarantees what the client is going to send to you. You can only trust what's inside of your own system and anything that is an entry point into your system needs to be very thoroughly shared. And for this, I use Joy, which is a very nice library to do assertions on incoming information. So basically what we do here is that we simply declare an email schema where we say that, okay, an email schema is going to be a string of the type email and it can be 255 characters. It's an arbitrary number that I decided on. And then we have a schema for the actual incoming email that we're going to send from the client to the server. And it's going to have a recipient, which is going to be an array of items which are going to be emails. And it has to be at least one new element in the recipients. Otherwise, hey, there's no email or there's no recipient to send the email to. And then we have the same thing for a subject and a message. And then basically I just we export this function here that just runs the validation. And if there is an error with the validation, we simply call next with an error, which is going to lead us to our error handler that is down here which is going to, like calling next with an error like that is going to land us here. It's going to skip everything else and hit this. And yeah, that, that's basically it. Otherwise, it's just going to allow you to continue. And then you hit this little function that I have as a convenience function. We can actually look at that. So catch exceptions is just, this is just a practice that I like to use when I use async await patterns in Node. Because it, one thing that you should know when you use async await is that it's going to behave as synchronous code. And the way that, that works is that if something goes wrong, if there's an error or something like that associated with your network call, your goal, it's going to be thrown. And that means that you need to try catch or something of that nature to catch that error since you're using the async await pattern. Unless you're using just traditional ES5 promises, then everything's fine because then you're using like the the dot then functions with a catch and a way to mitigate this to not have to nest a bunch of try catchers and stuff of that nature in in your uh, router it, this is what I do so I just take in a function and then I return a, a middleware or like a request um, an action handler which is going to have the same syntax as you've seen before and then all that does is that it returns a prom or it just calls promise.resolve with that function and I pass in the request and the response and then I have a catch clause around it all that will call next with the error if there is an error. And what that allows me to do is just to, yeah, well, basically it allows me to just wrap my action handler like this and now I can write, use async and wait and I don't have to wrap everything in a try catch and I don't have to nest things or anything like that. So it's just a little, a little convenience. And then we grab the recipients, the subject, and the message. Recipients is in this scenario. We've made a few changes to that, so we'll look at that as well. And then we have a service, which has the create email function. We're going to look at that as well, where we just take in the recipients, the subject, and the message. Now, you don't have to write code in this specific manner. It's just a very scalable way, which is very associated to a concept called domain-driven design, which you can look up. It's actually a very rare pattern in a lot of JavaScript development, but it's a pattern that I think that we should adopt because it's very common in Java, C Sharp, and other types of enterprise application development, and it scales extremely well. So if we just have a little bit of a look at the structure here, so we've added this lib directory, and inside of the lib directory we have the services and just the utils where we had our catch exceptions function because I didn't really know where to put that. Made sense to put it there. And in our services, we have this index.js file where basically what we do is that we grab the email model, which is the model that we store to the database, and then we grab the service for the email. And then we instantiate the email service with the email model. And the reason why we do that hopefully will be clear in just a moment where we will look at some testing and stuff of that nature. So let's just briefly look at the email model. Oh no, this, this is the test. The email model is what we want to look at. So it's just a Mongo's e email schema or a, a model where we have a recipient that is of type array. A subject Im is important because we know we, we're going to have to say whether or, not, whether or not an email is important or not. 
and then we have a message and a timestamp. Like this is just a basic implementation. Real emails like HTML emails and so forth can be a lot more elaborate, but since this is for learning purposes, this is fine for now. And then we have our email service, which is right now very simple, where we just have a class that takes in the email model, still stores it. So we have this is going to represent our model and our connection to the database. And then it has a single function that is called create email, which basically just creates the email model and returns it. And that's it. Later on, we will add more methods and functionality to this service. But for now, this is good enough. And let's have a look at some of the tests that are associated with this. So of course we are writing unit tests for each of, each of the things that we are building. So first and foremost we, are, we have some tests here for validating in the incoming email and this is all done using Jest. And basically what I've just made a bunch of tests here to verify that depending on like if I send in a, if the request is coming in I just want to be make sure that the validation is going to be handled properly and that we get the correct error message so this is yeah it's pretty yeah, you can pause the video and just have a look at these different tests there they should be fairly straightforward right and then we have some tests for the email model now this is a little bit of a special one so the way that email models the the thing with an email model is that it actually it's a test to, that i write to make sure that the serialization of the information that goes to and from the database is actually happening so this is not a pure unit test it's more of an integration test if you will where we are actually going to hook up to the database so we're going to create a, establish a connection to mongodb and just open up a test database and that's going to happen before everything else and then after we're just going to close that and that, that's basically it and then before each we're going to simply remove all of the emails that we have stored in the database. So every time we run a test, we're simply going to clean clean the database and run our test. And because we don't want the, the database to be, or rather we don't want the state of the database to pollute our tests, because if we have a test that depends, assumes that there's a clean state in the database, but there's data in the database, well, that's gonna mess up our test, right? And then we have a very basic test where we just instantiate a model and we simply save it to the database like this, and then we find the database by the email, uh, the or sorry, the email's ID, and then we have an expected output. We stringify it and just ex and compare the strings, and that's about it. So now we can verify whether or not our connection to the database works, and we can of course just run npm test to verify that our all our tests are working. We have a, quite a few more of them, but this should pass now. And yes, it does. So we all our tests are passing and our serialization is working and our connection to the database is working. This is awesome. And then we have email service spec, which is a very sim, like it's a service, it's a test just for testing out the service. So first and foremost, we just define that we make sure that we have the email service. And then we do this thing here. And this is where the injection of the model comes into play here. Because if you put the, if you require the model, if you were to require this model inside of this service, it would be a bit of a hassle for you to test out the functionality. Because the thing is, when I'm testing this service, I don't really care about the connection to the database. I just want to fake that because what I care about is the internal logic. Now, this logic is very simple, but imagine if I had a function which we Will have in the future that does a lot of different things then I just want to mock away or fake the actual connections to the database as much as possible because I don't want to run write a bunch of tests that always go to the database because that's going to be quite slow and unperformant when the system gets up to scale so what I do here is that I create this yes to mock function that I and that I can pass into the email service now the emails from the email service perspective it doesn't care if this is a real database connection or not it just needs this function right and then I just declare the variables that I want to pass to create email and then finally I just make sure that this this function was called with the correct input and as you saw earlier it actually it actually works so now we have verified that if we run this in a live environment, everything is going to happen the way that we expect it to, which is awesome. So finally, we want to have a little bit of a look at the front end code that has changed. So let's have a look at the navigation bar. So the navigation bar has, our on, has an on send function. And that on send function is basically here to, this is as we've seen earlier, this is just now updated to 
to actually send the request to the to the server, right? So we grab all of the emails, like the the field va values of our form that we have, and then we have this little helper function, send email request. And send email request, all it is is basically that it's going to take in the recipient's string, the subject and the message. And then we do a, we have a regex matching here to just verify if someone is inputting one email or several emails. Let's have actually have a look at that. So what I can do is that I can do foo at bar.se for example, but I can also give it a colon and just keep on going and say foo at bar.se or a space foo at bar.se and so forth. And then I can just fill out this information, hit send, and it's actually going to be able to handle that. And the reason why it handles that is because of this little transformation here. So this string is what's in that, it was in the recipients field. And then we simply use this regex to split so that we are left with an array of all these values. And then we trim these values, trim all the strings. And then basically we just match against the, the regex to make sure that we don't actually keep any of the like excess values like the colons or the spaces or anything like that. So what's going to happen is we're going to be left with just an array of these emails. It's just a little nice touch I think to it all. And then we store our data. Awesome. And this is our request. And it's going to be a post and we're going to post application JSON content. And then finally we stringify our data into the body and return the request. Awesome. So now that we have our request all tidy up and done, we wrap this in a try catch and then we use fetch to actually post our data to the server and then we get a response. And basically if the response isn't okay, which is, you know, in the case where we either send something that's not like the recipient, as you saw earlier, if that's not an email, we're going to hit this. And then we parse the JSON and then we throw an error with the, respo with the response error because we respond by just sending back a JSON object with the error property. We can actually look at that, I think, if we take a look at the network. Let's have a look here. So if I go and click here, and we do something like that, and that, and that, and then we send, hit send, we see now that a hey, validation of child recipients, yada, 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 and you can see the error is actually being shown correctly. But if I do this, and we do something like that and we hit that instead we're going to have a response where we actually now have all the data that has been stored in our system awesome right so that's basically it and as you can see here we simply have well, pretty much the same setup as we had in the previous video and yeah and then we have a basic test just to verify that we can actually trust that the send email request function is going to format our string recipient strings correctly and that we get the expected output just some basic tests to make sure that it behaves in the way that we that we want cool i know that this was a lot of information but uh, there was quite a few things to to be done before we could move on to the next step so if we now look at our trello board here we see that the next thing is going to be to have a look at getting to actually see some emails now that we've stored all these emails we want to remove these hardcore encoded things and when we hit sent email we want to actually see the stuff that we have sent out so that's going to come up next <laughs>